Let's look at the bony pelvix. After watching this video, we should be able to describe the bony pelvix, where it is located, the functions, the structural components, and the morphology of each of the bony components of the pelvis. The joints seen within the pelvis, the pelvic cavity, the differences between the male and the female pelvis, also the clinical anatomy and application. The pelvis is a bony structure that looks like a bow. It is a basin-shaped structure that is seen in the pelvic region. There can be alteration in the shapes and the dimension of the pelvis, but there is a basic general configuration of the bony pelvis, and that is what this lecture will be unfolding. The bony pelvis is the bony configuration of the pelvic cavity. It is located in the lower part of the trunk. If we take off the upper limb and the lower limb region, we have the trunk region, and the lower part of the trunk is made up of the pelvic cavity. And the bony configuration of this space is the pelvic bone. So it is located between the abdomen. This is the abdominal region and the lower limb. So the functions of the pelvis include that it helps to bear the weight of the upper part of the body. We've said that it is seen in the lower part of the trunk. So the weight of the upper part of the body are put on the pelvis. It also helps to protect abdominal pelvic visceral. It's a cavity. And of course, we know that cavities are spaces. And the space is contained with viscerals. So it helps to protect and houses this structure. Also, it has as a shock absorber, especially in the region of the acetabulum lined with cartilage. It helps to absorb shock that is infringed in that area. And this is seen mostly during childbirth. Also, it helps to provide the attachment for muscles. We have a lot of muscles that are attached to this bone, and this will be unfolding during the course of this lecture. It also provides bony support for the birth canal also supports locomotion. There is a specific region in the pelvis where the lower limb attaches to. So it helps to create attachment site for the bones of the lower limb. So thereby helping to support locomotion or movement. The components of the pelvic bone have been subdivided into two major components. And this include the pelvic gidu. The pelvic gidu is an incomplete circular region that is created by the pelvic bone. And running from this region down to this region is the pelvic gidu. And the second subdivision is the pelvic spine, which is also known as the pelvic vertebra. And this is seen in the posterior part. So we have an incomplete circle, which is called the gidu. And we have the spine, which helps to fill up the posterior open space that is created by the incomplete circle formed by the pelvic gidu. We would be taking the subdivisions one after the other to see what they are structurally made up of and also the functions that they exhibit. Let's look at the pelvic gidu. The pelvic gidu, we've said that is an incomplete circular region that is formed. And from this region down to this region is the pelvic gidu. The pelvic gidu is made up of three pieces on one side. So this is like from this region down to this region is one side of the pelvic gidu, and from this region to this region is another side of the pelvic gidu. So we have two, one on the right side and one on the left side. Each one is made up of three bones. We have three bones making up this region, and we have three bones making up this region. So for this one side, we have the ilium, and this is the ilium. The ilium is the upper part of the pelvic gidu. We have the ischium. The ischium is located in the lower posterior region. And we have the pubis. And this is the pubis in the anterior part. And as we have this configuration on this side, we also have on this side, which means that this is the ilium, this is the pubic, and this is the ischium. So the ilium is the upper part. We have the lower posterior part as the ischium, and we have the anterior part as the pubis. So that is the way the bones are arranged. So let's drive a bit in to see the configuration of each of these components. We have the ilium. We've said that the ilium is the upper and the most superior part of the pelvic gidu. 
and it is the largest of the three bones. We have tried to separate it from the other subunits that form the pelvic giddle. So from this region down to this region is the ileum. So we'll be looking at the ileum now to see what they present. The ileum is made up of the body, and this is the body of the ileum. The body of the ileum is the lower part of the ileum. And of course, it contributes to the formation of the acetabulum. Acetabulum is an indentation that receives the head of the femur. And this is where the lower limb attaches to. And the second region is the hala. The hala is also referred to as the wing. So this is the hala of the ileum. It is the upper expanded superior region of the ileum. You can see it's like the shape of the wing of a butterfly. Then the next region of the ileum is the iliac crest. This is the iliac crest. This is the most superior edge of the ala or the wing. And this is for muscle attachments. And this is the iliac crest. We also have the iliac fossa. An indentation is seen on the anterior part of the hala. It's like an indentation. And this indentation is filled up with a muscle that is called the iliacus muscle. So this is the iliac fossa. Posterior to the hala is where the gluteus muscle attaches to. Then the next region that I'll be talking about is the anterior superior iliac spine. So we need to break this name down, anterior, because this is the anterior view of the pelvis. Superior means it's the upper part. Iliac because it's the ilium, and the spine because it's like a, like a protrusion. So the anterior superior iliac spine. This is the anterior superior iliac spine. That's the upper protrusion that is seen around the anterior superior part. And this spine is where the inguinal ligament attaches to, also sartorius muscle. Sartorius muscle is a narrow muscle that runs diagonally in the anterior part of the lower limb. So this is where they form the origination from and also the tensor facial latter. So if we have the anterior superior iliac spine, because the way it runs in anatomy, we should be looking forward to seeing the anterior inferior iliac spine. And that is what is next. We have the anterior inferior iliac spine, and this is the anterior inferior iliac spine. So it's like the spine that is created inferior to the anterior superior iliac spine. And what attaches to this region is the rectus femoris. We know the rectus femoris is also one of the muscles that is seen in the anterior part of the thigh. So this is where it originates from. And of course, it descends downwards along the lower limb. The next region of the ileum is the auricular surface. We know that the ileum is the upper superior part. There's going to be a link between it and the pelvic spine. It is the ileum that actually forms a connection with the pelvic spine. So the surface onto which it connects with the pelvic spine is the auricular surface, and this is the auricular surface. So we need to detach or remove the sacrum for us to see that inner surface. Then the next region is the aquate line. This is like a rounded eminence that is seen along the internal border of the ileum. And this is the aquate line. It runs like that. It's like a bulge. It's seen on the interior, or the internal border of the ileum. Try to turn the pelvics to the posterior side. We also need to highlight some features around the posterior region. Remember when we talk about the anterior superior iliac spine and the anterior inferior iliac spine, we should know that for them to have anterior, we definitely must have a posterior superior iliac spine. And that will be the next structure we'll be highlighting. And this is the posterior superior iliac spine. Then we have the posterior inferior iliac spine. This is the posterior inferior iliac spine. The posterior superior iliac spine and posterior inferior iliac spine are for the attachment of muscles. This tile to the spine, we have a depression. There is a very sharp depression that is seen below posterior inferior iliac spine, and that is the greater sciatic notch. This is the greater sciatic notch. The greater sciatic notch is a region of the ileum. So for us to know, if we have a greater sciatic notch, definitely we should expect a lesser sciatic notch. And we'll see that during the course of this lecture. This notch will be transformed into a foramen by a ligament, which tends to transform this notch that is seen as an indentation on the bone to a foramen. So let's talk about the pelvic bone. We've said that the pelvic giddle, we have the ileum in the, in the superior upper region, 
we have the pubic in the anterior region, then we have the ischial in the posterior part. From this region to this region is the pubic. So we have the pubic also from this region to this region. So we have one on the right and one on the left. And of course, it is in the region of the pubic that the pelvic giddu is connected anteriorly. So it is through the pubic that the pelvic giddu connects. So we have the right pubic bone connecting with the left pubic bone in the anterior part. So the pubic bone can be subdivided into the body, and this is the body. So we have the body, the right part of the body, the left part of the body, which means that specifically it is in the body region that the pubic bone connects together. It is through the body of the pubic that the pelvic giddu connects anteriorly. Then we have rami. We have two rami. So you can see that from the body, we have an extension superiorly and we have an extension inferiorly. So the extension superiorly is the superior ramus, and this is the superior ramus. Then we have an inferior ramus, which is an extension that is seen inferiorly. For the superior ramus, the superior ramus contributes to the formation of the acetabulum, while the inferior ramus forms the pubic hack. And this is the pubic hack. So the right inferior ramus and the left inferior ramus of the pubic bone join to form an arc pattern presentation that is called the pubic hack. And this is the pubic hack. The pubic hack varies in both the male and female. We should expect that in female it should be wider so as to allow easy exit of the baby through the pelvic region. The ischium from the lower posterior part. So, so this is the region of the ischium. You can see the ileum at the upper part, the pubic at the anterior part. Then posteriorly, we have the ischium. So the ischium is made up of the body, and this is the body. The body is the upper part of the ischium, and this body forms a contribution to the acetabulum. Then we have the ramus, which is an extension that is seen running down from the body. And this is the ramus. Then we have this ischial spine. The ischial spine is like a pointed process. And this is the ischial spine. The ischial spine is somewhere around this region. It's like a bulge or a pointed region. So a ligament runs from this spine down to the sacrum, thereby transforming this greater sciatic notch into the sciatic foramen. Then we have the lesser sciatic notch. Remember when we talk about the greater sciatic notch as part of the ileum, the lesser sciatic notch is like an indentation that is created along the lower part of the ischium. So this is the lesser sciatic notch, ischial tuberosity. This ischial tuberosity is like a swelling that is seen around the lower posterior part of the ramus, and this is the ischial tuberosity. And this tuberosity allows for the attachment of the sacrotuberous ligament. That means we have another ligament running from the sacrum and is attached to this tuberosity. And of course, this helps to convert this lesser sciatic notch into the sciatic foramen. So now we see that this notch, the greater sciatic notch and the lesser sciatic notch are eventually transformed into a foramen that allows passage of structures within the pelvic cavity down to the posterior bottom region and to the lower limb region. What about the body of the ileum, the ischium, and also the superior ramus of the pubis? We said that this is the ala, this is the body of the ileum. This is also the body of the ischium, and this is the ramus. Then we have the body of the pubis, the superior ramus, and the inferior ramus. We have the superior ramus of the pubis contributing to the formation of the acetabulum. This is the acetabulum, the indentation that receives the head of the femur. Then we have the body of the ileum. The body of the ileum also contributes to the formation of the acetabulum. We also have the body of the ischium. This is the body and this is the ramus. So the body of the ischium also contributes to the formation of the acetabulum. So we now see that the acetabulum is formed by the three bones that forms the pelvic giddle. And this is the acetabulum. This creates attachment for the head of femur. It is also important for us to have that the obliterator foramen is formed by the ischium and the pubis. This is the body of the pubis. 
This is superior ramus, this is the inferior ramus. This is the body of the ischium, and this is the ramus of the ischium. So the ramus of the ischium, the inferior ramus of the pubis, and the superior ramus of the pubis all form the obliterator foramen, which is the largest hole in the body. So this is the obliterator foramen. And this obliterator foramen is covered incompletely by the obliterator membrane. So we have a membrane covering this space, but not completely, thereby creating a space that is called the obliterator canal. So we have the obliterator membrane and the obliterator canal. This membrane creates attachment for the obliterator muscle. That's the obliterator externus and the obliterator internus. Why this space it allows the passage of the obliterator vessel, the obliterator artery, which is a branch of the internal iliac artery. We know that the internal iliac artery is contained within the pelvis. And as the obliterator artery branches from it, it exits the pelvic region through the obliterator canal. We also have the obliterator vein and also the obliterator nerve. So this is another fact that we need to add when studying the pelvic. Pelvic spine. We've said that the entire pelvic is divided into the pelvic gidu, which is an incomplete ring that is formed by three bones fused together and it is incomplete posteriorly, and this incomplete space is filled up with the pelvic spine. So this is the pelvic spine. The pelvic spine is a terminal portion of the vertebral column. We know we have a cervical, the thoracic, the lumbar, the sacral, and the costigial bone. So the last two bones, which are the sacrum and the costic, form the pelvic spine. And this is the sacrum in the upper part and we have the cortex in the lower till part. So let's look at these bones one after the other, the sacrum. We said that the sacrum forms part of the pelvic spine and it is made up of the ala of the wings. And this is the hala, a broad lateral part of the bone. Then we have the sacral promotory. This is the sacral promotory. And this is like a protrusion that is seen in the superior part of the sacrum. This protrusion is what gives the pelvic inlet a love-shaped pattern. Then it has a base. This is the base of the sacrum. The base is a surface onto which the lumbar vertebra rests upon. Then we have the apex. This is the apex. And it is through the apex that it connects with the cossix. And this is the apex. Then we have the sacral foramen. You can see on the lateral border of the sacral bone, you see O's on both sides. This is for the passage of the sacral nerve. Then we have the sacral canal. So within the sacral bone, there is a canal that is seen along its median region. And this canal accommodates the terminal part of the spinal cord. The cortex is like a triangular shaped bone that is seen attached to the distal part of the sacrum. And this is the cortex. The cortex does not really give a structural support in the formation of the pelvis, but it creates sites for the attachment of muscles. Let's quickly look at the joint that is formed within the pelvix. We have the pubic symphysis. The pubic symphysis is a joint through which the anterior region of the pelvic gidu are connected. We've described that the pubic forms the anterior part of the pelvic gidu. And we said that it is through the body that one side of the pelvic gidu connects with the other side. So it is along this region that we have the formation of the pubic symphysis. And in classifying this type of joint, we say it is a secondary cartilaginous joint. It is secondary because even at the mature stage, you still see the cartilaginous deposit within the space of where this joint is formed. The second joint that is seen is the sacroiliac joint. And this is the sacroiliac joint from the name. All we need to do is to break it down, joint between the sacrum and the ilium. And this joint is a synovial type of joint. More specifically, is a diacrodial type of synovial joint. Then the pelvic cavity. The pelvic cavity is the space that is created by the pelvic bone. And we have the pelvic inlet. And this is the pelvic inlet. The pelvic inlet is also referred to as the pelvic brain. And it is limited posteriorly by the sacral promotory that we'll talk about which is a protrusion of the upper part of the sacral bone, the wing of the sacrum, 
this is the sacrum. We also talk about the wing. So from the sacral promontory, we have the, the hala of the sacrum or the wing. From there, we have the aqueous line that we talked about, that it's like a protrusion seen within the, the internal border of the ilium. Then from there, we have the upper border of the superior ramus of the pubic. Then we have the upper border of the pubic symphysis. This forms the pelvic inlet. This pelvic inlet is of great clinical importance because it is used to measure the pelvimetry dimension in females. And this helps to give an assessment if the head of the baby is seen to be bigger than this pelvic inlet, then they may need to take to other option of birth. Then we have the pelvic outlet. The pelvic outlet is below and it is bounded by the pelvic floor. It is bounded by the inferior border of the pubic symphysis. We have the lower border of the inferior ramus of the pubic, ramus of the ischium. We have the ischial spine. Then we have a ligament that we talked about in our previous slide that connects the spine of the ischium to the sacrum. Then finally, we have the cossix, the tip of the cossix forming the pelvic outlets. This is the pelvic inlet below, bounded inferiorly, we have the pelvic outlets. So the pelvic brain is able to divide the entire pelvic space into two. So we have the greater pelvic region above the pelvic brain. So this is the pelvic brain as we discussed. So superior to the pelvic brain, we have the greater or the first pelvis. It is the greater pelvis because it is at the upper part and also first pelvis because it contains lower abdominal viscerals such as the ileum and the sigmoid colon. So this is what you see within this space. Then inferior to the pelvic brain, which is the lower part, is a region that is termed the lower pelvis or the true pelvis. It is the true pelvis because it is where we have the viscerals of the pelvis contained, and this include most reproductive organs and urinary organs. We also have the pelvic floor. The pelvic floor is made up of collection of muscle that lines the pelvic outlet. It's also referred to as the pelvic diaphragm. They help to hold in place the pelvic viscera. So this is how the muscles are padded, forming the inferior band, so helping to hold the pelvic viscera in place. The next structure is the perineum below the pelvic diaphragm. So this starts to the pelvic diaphragm, you have space that is called the perineum. Differences between the pelvic bones have been highlighted. This is basically to give support to the female reproductive viscerals, as we know that the female undergo pregnancy and also birth. So let's look at the differences that we have between the male pelvic and the female pelvic. For the male pelvic, we say that it is stronger than what we have in the female. It's also more wider in female and less wider in male. It is wider in female because the head of the fetus will definitely be passing through and needs to be wide so as to be able to accommodate the head of the baby. It's also less shallow in male. It is more shallow in females. We also have the pubic heart. We talk about the pubic heart that is formed by the inferior ramus of the pubis, and this is the pubic heart. In male, it is less wide. In female, it is wider. It's just to create more space for expansion downwards. Then in the male, we say it is heavier. Female pelvics are lighter. The pelvic outlet is narrow. In male, while the pelvic outlet in female is wider, this can also be justified to support the birth process. It is longer in male and it is shorter in female. Also, the acetabulum is less wider parts in male, but in female, the acetabulum is more wider. Clinical anatomy, we talk about fracture and dislocation. So there can be fracture, which means breakage. There could also be dislocation when there's a detachment. We've talked about the different types of joints that we have in the pelvic. This is fracture. This is the sacrum. This is the ileum part of the pelvic guido. And if you have a detachment, we term as dislocation. Then application, we have cephalopelvic disproportion. This is like the head of the baby, and this is the pelvic brain. So when the head of the baby and the pelvic brain do not come in a proportionate size, which means that the head will not be able to pass through this space. Other alternative will be taken into consideration, and this could include cesarean section. 
This is our brain task. And we can test our understanding of this lecture through the following. Describe the structural components of the bony pelvics. Also list 10 differences between the male and the female pelvics. We've tried to list some, we can also add to it. So thank you for watching.